Good morning. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to come before your presence, to worship with your people, to have fellowship with those who we'll be spending eternity with. Lord, what a joy it is to look into your word and to study the life of your son, Jesus. Look to him as our Savior, as our Lord, and as our God. That as we submit ourselves to the teaching of your word, that we submit ourselves to the, to the word itself, to Jesus Christ. I pray that you might help us this morning for our minds to be sharp, for our hearts to be soft. That, Lord, we might know what it is that you'd have us do. So, Lord, here we are. We pray that your spirit would speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So today, we're back in the book of Mark in chapter 11. It's the only time Jesus cursed. Boy, you, you people are really quiet today. <laughs> and if you're, if you're a mature Christian, you know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you're like, I can't believe he said that. <laughs> it's okay. The, basically, the next section is about fruitlessness. If you've had uh, a garden... Here in the garden state, it doesn't guarantee that you'll get fruit, especially if you have birds and rabbits and squirrels and all manner of things, and especially deer, if you want to put any foliage around your house. Uh, they just love those things, so by all means, feed them. <laughs> but Jesus is now coming in his final week. This is his final week on earth in his physical body. And this is his final week. Uh, it's called Holy Week in a lot of church circles. Uh, there's a lot of unholy things going on during Holy Week, so I'm reluctant to call it that. But Jesus is going to see a lot of fruitlessness. And he, there's this curious story about Jesus finding a fig tree and cursing it. And so we're going to talk about that and what in the world that possibly could mean. So previously we have talked in chapter 10, we talked about divorce a few weeks ago and about what Jesus taught on it, some various rabbis and what they taught on it, and we got straight on what that's all about. And we saw Jesus have a confrontation with a rich young ruler, um, the rich young ruler saying, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God, to inherit the kingdom of God? And Jesus said, you just got one thing, just one thing you need to do. Uh, you need to leave everything and come and follow me essentially, which is the same thing he asks each one of us to do, is that we put everything in his hands, we put everything at his feet, and we follow him. And Jesus, again, talking about children and their importance and how important it is not to stumble. One of these children of mine, Jesus said, it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and drown in the ocean. So Jesus's paternal instinct coming out. And then we spoke last week about spiritual blindness. We saw Jesus taking the disciples aside again and saying, I just want you to be prepared because as we go to Jerusalem this final time, the Son of Man is going to be turned over to the Pharisees, to the chief priests, the scribes, and he will be crucified. They will spit at him. And he gives them the whole thing, but in three days he will rise. And the disciples had absolutely no idea what he was talking about, even though it was the third time he said it. So... As they move on, we see this power play by James and John coming up alongside with their mother saying, you know, Jesus, we want you to do whatever we tell you. <laughs> He's like, what is it? <laughs> well, that these sons of mine, James and John, would sit on the right and left hand sides of you when you enter into your kingdom. This anticipation that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to take up the throne of his father, David, and to deliver them from the Romans which was not at all what he just told them he was going there to do. And so they're spiritually blind. And of course, Jesus then comes to a man named Bartimaeus who's blind and he heals him. Much easier to hear, heal somebody who's physically blind than someone who's physic than spiritually blind. So it's an interesting section of scripture. So this week, we're going to look at fruitlessness or when Jesus cursed. Verse 1, now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany 
at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the village opposite you and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. That's a little sketchy. If I said, hey, listen, I want you to go outside and uh, it's a beautiful BMW. <laughs> the keys would be in it. What I'd like you to do is drive it down the street and meet me. You would say, no. And you would be right to do so. Because I don't drive a BMW. <laughs> Jesus exercising his omnipotence and his omniscience and knowing all things, or perhaps he had something pre-planned. He tells them to go into the next town. It's interesting that you see three towns here. One is they're going to Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany. So we have three towns to choose from. We know that they're staying in Bethany with Mary and Martha and Lazarus, their brother, and that's basically where they're bivouacked. And it's about two miles away from Jerusalem. So they have, a, they have a walk every day that they go into this festival of Passover. Every single day they get a two-mile walk. And you, you thought you had a hard time parking this morning. <laughs> so here's basically where Bethany is. And say so they were going from Bethany to Bethpage and to Jerusalem, which is here. So it's a, it's a mile in between each, and it's uh, two miles to Jerusalem, just to give you an idea. And this is the kind of topography that there is. There are mountains there. And he also has to go past the Mount of Olives. So he's going to be coming down that mountain and approaching Jerusalem, actually from the backside of what they would consider the back door of Jerusalem. So this is the, the path that Jesus is taking. And he says, go on ahead of me to the next town with presumably is it's Bethphage is actually how it's pronounced. It sounds French, but it's not. Uh, and it actually means the place of green figs. Your trivial note for the day. And Bethany, which Bet or Beth means house, uh, it means house of dates. So we have olives and dates and figs. Oh my, we have lots of fruit, <laughs> lots of fruit in here. So Jesus is in his final week and approaching Jerusalem. So this is just telling us where and how. You notice Jesus borrows a lot of things. I'm not a fan of borrowing things because then you take on liability. You know, like somebody says, here, here, take my car. No, no, I don't want to borrow your car. Because if I crash it, I'll feel miserable. And I don't want to take responsibility for that. Any of you, anybody else feel that way? I don't, want to borrow, I don't want to borrow anything of yours. You know, my wife says, listen, there's something in my purse. Could you go in there? No, I'm not going in there. I'm not going to go swimming in your purse. And I, I, don't know what's, I don't know what's in there. And, you know, I need a map. You know, she tells me to get something out of a cabinet. I need a map. Yeah, yeah, go get the uh, special garlic infused. So, uh, so she, she actually has these wonderful things with labels on them now that are so small that I pull it out and I have to look at it closely. Jesus giving some things about what to do. And he says, listen, I, I don't have a, a, a ride of my own, so I need you to go borrow one. Uh, this is not a common thing. And uh, horse thievery, even in the West here in this country, was something punishable by death. So um, you can imagine being one of the two disciples who's going, presumably it's Peter, because we get more details in this account than we do in the other Gospels. So I'm thinking Peter was one of them, but he didn't want people to know it was him that lifted this thing. But Jesus sends them in. I, I'm struck by verse 3. When you go there, and if they say to you, hey, what are you doing loosening the cult? Just tell them, the Lord has need of it. Would you buy that? Somebody comes up here and, and starts taking the microphone down, even if it's Rocco. <laughs> what are you doing? The Lord has need of it. <laughs> it, it, it's, it doesn't seem like that's a whole lot of an explanation as to what's happening here. 
But Jesus is borrowing this colt that's never been ridden. And if you know anything about riding an animal that's never been ridden, they call it the rodeo. <laughs> not, not something you want to be a part of if you're Jesus going into town and announcing yourself as the coming Messiah that was prophesied long ago, a descendant of David. So Jesus is heading into town and he says, I need you to get me. Now it's only two miles. Jesus is accustomed to walking far longer. So why would he pimp somebody's ride? Why would he jack somebody's transportation? It's, it's very interesting. The Lord needs it. I, let me ask you, what does the Lord need? Nothing. The Lord needs nothing. Well, then why did Jesus say the Lord needs it? It's interesting. How do people get saved? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they hear unless someone is sent? So in order for God to get his will done, he needs us to respond in partnership. My children wouldn't exist if it wasn't for my wife and I deciding to have them. There are many things in our lives where we are partnered with the Lord and he condescends and comes low to partner with us. Did he twist your arm to get here this morning? Did you willingly submit yourself to do so? Yeah. It's this beautiful partnership where we get the idea like so many children making finger paints. Look what I made. And he puts it up on the refrigerator. Without us, he cannot do what he would. Without him, we can do nothing. I just wish you to understand that there is a partnership and our obedience and our yielding to him is important. In fact, this whole Sunday is about that and the reluctance of the Jews to receive Christ for who he really is. And there are some responses and some consequences for it. This divine partnership is forged when he condescends to enlist our service to him as he gifts us and empowers us for his sake. You know, we are all the body of Christ and individual members of it. And he gives each of one of us a gift, at least one, if not several. And to the one whom much is given, much is required. Yeah. If he could do it all, why would he give us gifts? because he condescends into a partnership with us. It's the mystery of salvation as well, as God leads us and we have an obligation to respond and we're told to repent and believe the gospel. There is this partnership and where, where do you draw the line between God's sovereignty and man's free will? Boy, that's the making of arguments for Saturday morning at men's breakfast. <laughs> the Lord needs it. My question is, does the Lord need you? He needs a donkey. Are you better than a donkey or worse than a donkey? He didn't have one of his own. I think the Lord needs you. You are uniquely equipped by God in his grace and by his spirit to do certain things that I cannot do. I need you. In fact, 1 Corinthians 13, talking all about love, is, is only comes to chapter 12 before, says that we're all necessary parts of the body of Christ. And the most important part of the body of Christ is the part that doesn't show up. So does God need you? Yeah. Could he do it another way? Sure. But he chooses not to. Anyway, that was fun. <laughs> So they went their way and they found the colt tied by the door outside of the street and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? It's always a biker for me. <laughs> but they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded and they let them go. Imagine what a miracle they thought this was. You mean you bought that? that the Lord has need of this? You actually believe that? And they did. 
And it wasn't even the people who owned the cult. It's those who were standing by. You know, you see somebody, you know, trying to pop your lock open. It's one thing when you see it. It's another thing when your neighbor sees it and says, hey, what are you doing to Pastor Dave's car? The Lord has need of it. Oh, okay, okay. never mind. It's, it's good. Imagine being sent on this mission. Imagine being one of the disciples going to jack this cult. Jesus needed good, reliable transportation. And you might ask why. Because there are prophecies that are made about the Messiah coming. And there's a picture that Jesus is filling in 1 Kings chapter 1, we're told about Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaniah the son of Jedidiah, and the Cherethites, and the Pelethites went down, and they had Solomon ride on the King David's mule, and they took him to Gihon. This is how Solomon was made king. They put him on David's mule and rode him in, and they proclaimed him king when Absalom was trying to undercut and take the kingdom for his own. So there's this interesting picture of a king not riding on a stallion, not coming as that, but humble on a donkey. Jesus asked two of his disciples to go on this mission, and it seemed preposterous to them, and they stepped out in faith and were obedient to do what he said, and they were overjoyed with the outcome. Does Jesus have an impossible mission for you? Perhaps it's a relative that doesn't know about Jesus. Perhaps it's somebody who needs your help. Something you say, oh, pff, not that guy. That guy will never receive Christ. Forget it. He's out there. Well, I'm glad somebody shared Christ with me. How about you? And I was out there. In Zechariah 9.9, the prophecy is said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. It doesn't say he came riding on a donkey alone. He says a colt, the foal of a donkey. Isn't it interesting how scripture just got it perfect? It's almost like the Lord knew what was going to happen. So there it is, Zechariah 9.9, 9, about Jesus coming. By the way, it's not the last time you'll see him on the back of an animal. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is coming again as a reigning king. He's not coming as a humble servant and slave any longer, where he comes and dies for your sin. He's coming to take charge, knock some heads together. And then Jesus brought the colt, then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So you know this as Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday before the Sunday where he's crucified. And he comes in and he sits on these clothes, kind of a makeshift saddle. The disciples put him on. And he's sitting on a colt that had never been ridden. And it was obedient to the one who created him. What else would you expect? And so here comes Jesus into Jerusalem. And they're all throwing clothes on the ground and leaves off the trees. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of replanting after this festival. They would typically do that so that the dirt and the mud that would happen on the roads wouldn't get on the lambs that were brought in for sacrifice, that they wouldn't get dirty. A little like a 4-H club. You want to keep these things clean because you don't want the, the priests to look at it and say, no, nah, you're disqualified. He's got spots all over him. It's only mud. Yeah, but you got to buy one of ours now. And they're trying to avoid that. And so what they would do is they would put all these things down. But it's also an act of submission of the people to put clothes down. To put your clothes on the ground. I mean, it used to be a chivalrous thing for a man to, you know, put his, you know, long time ago, black and white film and everything. <laughs> but here, they're showing honor 
and deference, and they're crying out, understanding and recognizing him as the Messiah, as the promised one who came. In Daniel 9.25, we're given the exact day when Jesus would come into Jerusalem, and he holds them accountable for this. 9.25 of Daniel says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, by the way, that was Mr. Uh, anyway, Artaxerxes Lajamanus. You, you don't care what his name is. It sounds like a disease, doesn't it? I'm sorry. And build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. You may remember Daniel was taken from Jerusalem and Jerusalem was sacked. So this prophecy is given to him that the Messiah would come and it's exactly 69 weeks. Uh, you and I understand a week as being seven days, but they have weeks of years, uh, weeks, uh, all kinds of different sevens, if you will. And so this is exactly when Jesus came. There was a guy, there was a guy in England who figured all this out, all the math. It's 1,700 and... Uh, 173,880 days, if you're counting, that's 483 years, and that's 69 weeks of years, so 69 times 7. And it comes to April 6, 62 AD, exactly on the head, which happened to be a Sunday, Passover in Jerusalem, the exact day that Jesus comes in. He looks over the city and he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've wanted to gather you like a mother gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are unwilling. And Jesus wept over the city as he was on his way in. Mark doesn't give us this uh, information, but Matthew does, how he wept over the city because he knew all of this hoopla is a false coronation because the same people that cried out Hosanna in the highest a week from now are going to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And so although it seems like this wonderful parade, like the Giants won the Super Bowl, that was a parade to remember. It's not that way because these people are just hyped with emotion, although they do recognize all the prophecies about him. And he comes exactly on the day when he's supposed to. And they say, Hosanna in the highest. They say, Hosanna, which means save now. <laughs> save now, we pray. And presumably, they're crying out that Jesus would save them from the Romans. They weren't thinking about saving them from their sin, which is why Jesus came. They're crying out that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which we find in Psalm 118. It begins, save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Now catch the last verse. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. That's exactly what happened in that week. They came in full of praise and recognizing him as a descendant of David. And yet suddenly they turn on him and they say, bind him to the sac, bind the sacrifice. And that's what happened with Jesus. And they recognize him as being David's descendant. He actually is descendant both from his surrogate father and his mother. Both of them are related to David. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple and so when he had looked around at all things, as his hour was already late, he went out, of Beth went out to Bethany with the 12. What? It's interesting. Jesus arrives. There's all of this fanfare. And Jesus goes into the temple. And he looks around. And he leaves. That seems strange. Like, da, 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 da. He looks around and he leaves. Because what he saw, he wasn't comfortable with. What he saw in the temple was not something that he wanted to endure. And it wasn't something he was ready to take action on at that moment. So Jesus looks around. He takes stock of everything. And he leaves and he goes back to Bethany. That's, that's where the hotel is. 
It's two miles away. Jesus is observing. In James chapter 1, 19 and 20, it says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I think Jesus was angry of what he saw when he was in the temple. Because the very next day when he comes back, he makes some changes. In Ecclesiastes 3.3 3 and verse 8, it says, There is a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time of peace. There is a place for hate, but not on our agenda. There are virtually dozens of things I could mention from here that should be hated. The internet is full of video of things that you should hate, of people abusing other people, people killing other people. People doing all sorts of things that they shouldn't be doing. Jesus walks into the temple and he sees an incredible amount of hypocrisy going on in the temple. And he doesn't do anything. It's late. He packs up the disciples and says, come on, let's go. And they go back to Bethany. You know, there's a time when you see something happening, you should say nothing. Sometimes we say nothing when we should speak. And sometimes we say nothing and we lift it to the Lord and say, God, give me wisdom. Help me so that when I do speak about this, it's not in my anger. And now the next day when they had come out of Bethany, so they spent the night in Bethany and they're on their way back to Jerusalem. He was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. He went to see perhaps if he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Well, I'm glad we talked about that. Jesus curses. And the disciples heard it. Don't you, isn't it hilarious how little kids pick up everything? Little kids will pick up whatever's going on. And if they hear you say something and slip, they will repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. They'll do it in church. They'll do it in, you know, company. They'll do it among other people who are shocked and chagrined that your child knows this word. Jesus was overheard cursing a fig tree because there weren't any figs on it, because it wasn't the time for figs. I'm sure the Arbor Day Foundation is going to have a lot to say to Jesus. <laughs> it seems out of character, doesn't it? It's the only time Jesus does this. And you've got to be thinking, maybe you just need a <laughs> Snickers. Because he was hungry. And so he reacted in, in his hanger. He, he, he was hungry. Stinking tree. That's it. I curse you. Never have fruit on you again. And you think, why would, why would this be recorded in Scripture? Why don't they just, look, we don't need that part. Because always, throughout all of the history of the Jewish people, Israel has always been pictured as a fig tree. Jesus is making a show and tell moment. He, there's a metaphor going on here. Jesus goes to look for fruit, but it's not time for fruit. We're told it's not time for figs. What did you expect? Well, you have to know something about figs because probably none of you raised them except for uh, Stephen Loyley. Some varieties produce one crop of figs each year while others produce two. Typically, from the stem growth, each, each year they ripen uh, and ripen months later. Each fig 
tree takes three to five years to start ripening fruit, and it will not endure being frozen. So if you keep them outdoors uh, here in this climate, they'll be done. Typically, they come up with these little buds that are edible, and it probably is in Beth Fage, right? Which is the land of green figs. It's rather interesting. So there, there could have been green figs on it. If there were these green buds, which are completely edible and people do, if you have those buds, then that means those are going to grow into figs. If you don't have those buds, you don't get any figs. So Jesus came up to see if those little buds were there and there was nothing. Just like as he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to find no fruit in Jerusalem because the people in Jerusalem are now not going to respond in the way they did when he entered. I wonder if Jesus came today, would he find fruit in our lives or just leaves? It's easy to put on a pretense. It's, it's easy, especially for me, in front of all of you, to pretend everything's good. I'm okay. I'm okay. Everything's good. And not really have any fruit. And that comes from abiding in the vine, doesn't it? Because we can do nothing without him. I just wonder if Jesus came up and said, hey, Dave, I want to pull some fruit off of you. I wonder if you'd find just leaves. I think about these things in the quiet of my office. And I think, what, what can I possibly do? Well, I, I, sometimes I need fertilization. Like any good plant. I need some manure poured on me. So this is a prophetic metaphor of Israel. And he's predicting what he's about to find as he goes. Verse 15. So they came to Jerusalem. Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves." Jesus walks in and he finds industry in the outer courts, which is the court of the Gentiles, which is the only place a Gentile could go. They could go no further. And they turned it into a flea market. And it just so happens that the Levites cornered the market on supplying clean animals if yours didn't quite measure up. And guess who inspected them? They did. It, it sounds like a government job, right? And they would find whether it was worthy or it was unworthy. And then you'd have to buy one of theirs, which is twice as much as you would get anywhere else. And not only that, you had to use the approved currency of the temple because you were not allowed to bring foreign money in. We allow sometimes Canadian coins, but, you know, foreign money was not accepted because it had the picture of someone on it usually, and they considered that a graven image. And so you would have to exchange it for the shekels that they had in the temple. And so while they were doing that, they made a ton of money off the exchange. And so they were making money every step of the way, and they turned the worship of God into a money-making scheme where the, the outlet of their greed could be exercised. And Jesus saw all of this that was going on in a place that was the only place the Gentiles could worship. If you wanted to worship Yahweh, you couldn't go into the temple proper. You could only go into the outer, but that outer area was a flea market. Jesus saw it the day before and didn't say anything. Jesus went there and took a good look and he cased the place. And he came back the next day ready to do business. The court of the Gentiles is this outer court area where all of this was going on. And if you were a Gentile, you were not even able to go in here. And unless you were the chief priest once a year, you couldn't even go in here. And so all of this is such a mess. It, 
That's why we don't have bingo in this church. That's why we don't have flea markets in this church. That's why we don't have car washes in this church. That's why we don't have a send Pastor Dave on vacation fund. It's one other thing you shouldn't do for me. Or get me a special parking spot that says for the pastor only. People trying to make me feel bad. Anyway, Jesus tears things up and it says in one of the other gospels that he made a cord. He made a whip of cords. And he didn't whip people, he whipped the animals to get them to move. And he cleaned the temple out and they all listened to him. Amazing. The whole tenor of Jesus' ministry has turned with the fig tree, hasn't it? He curses this fig tree and says, there'll be no more fruit on you. 70 AD, the Romans come in and they burn the temple to the ground. Unintentionally, actually. And then after it was out, they pried all the rocks off each other and they dug out all the gold that had melted between the, the blocks. So Jesus said, because you did not recognize this your day, woe to you. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. And then evening had come and he went out of the city. Jesus came, tore the place up, cleaned it out so it could be a place of worship to God and not just a place of industry and money making. And he spent the day there. And of course, the chief priests got together and their response is, we got to kill this guy. You're having a religious festival <laughs> towards God and you're plotting to murder someone. Do you not see the hypocrisy in this? It's just like the fig tree. And so Jesus, knowing this, he ends up withdrawing and going back to the hotel, if you will. Proverbs 25, 14, whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds without wind, without rain. Wind without rain, like clouds and wind without rain. Like clouds without rain. These guys were all religious on the outside, but their hearts are scheming murder. You know, sometimes I see myself in the Pharisees because I can be very judgmental and not as gracious like I was a sinner like everyone else. Churches have that reputation, which we should break. Amen? Amen. Amen. Much like the fig tree, they were all leaves and no fruit. Now in the morning, as they passed by, this is Jesus and the disciples again, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. One of many of the duh moments of Peter. <laughs> duh, Peter. Look, Lord, it happened just like you said. That reveals a real lack of faith, doesn't it? Like anything Jesus say, uh, is it ever going to fall to the ground like a dead bird? No, it's always going to happen. I wonder if we would be so disclosive if we told of our lives in Jesus. Remember, the book of Mark is actually being spoken by Peter to John Mark, who's writing all of this down. And Peter is giving us all of his dumb moments. I wonder if we would be so free about telling people of our own duh moments. Does it seem, I don't know, not modest <laughs> to share your inadequacies and your shortcomings and your flat out lack of faith? Does it seem as though you're kind of walking around naked if you share those things? Uh, yeah. But you know, it's in our weakness that his strength is made perfect. That's what he told Paul when he prayed three times for this thorn in the flesh to be removed. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. 
People, when we show our vulnerability, when we show our shortcomings, we reveal to people that we're just like them. And we're in need of a savior, just like them. And so be humble. Be like Peter. Share your dumb moments. A sad reminder that even God has a timetable for us to bear fruit. I think about all of the various judgments that have come down. You think about Lot and about how he was removed from Sodom before God poured out wrath. There was a timetable and there was a time. Just like this tree, there was a time for it to bear fruit, but it didn't. Just like Israel, there was a time for it to bear fruit, but it didn't. I think about Samson who had every opportunity to repent, and he didn't. I think about Ananias and Sapphira, who had opportunities to tell the truth, and they didn't. I think about all of these things, and I wonder, is there a timetable? Is it tick, 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 tick? Is God waiting for me to do something? Is he speaking to my heart to repent of something or to do something or to take that mission to go find a cult that I don't want to do? I wonder. But I see the tree was cursed that it would bear no more fruit and it would never have any more fruit. And we see in 70 AD the destruction of the temple and there is no more sacrificial system even to this day where they can obey the scriptures through sacrifice. And I think, is the time ticking for me, Lord? It's a worthy question. So, this is called fruitless, or the day that Jesus cursed. Next week, we're going to talk about authority issues. Any of you have authority issues? Not that you'd admit. Okay, good. We're going to talk about authority issues Jesus is going to be grilled as to by what authority he does these things. And he's going to be asked a hundred questions. They're going to play stump the teacher. And Jesus is going to tell them the truth right between the eyes. So tune in. <music>